Here is a video about the new house, the third of the three homes where we three lived during childhood and youth. If you saw the earlier videos about the previous home, the Bell Place, you will remember seeing this map of the farm which showed how the road came from the highway and snaked around to make a, a wide curve around a high knoll in order to get up to the level of the rest of the farm and to continue on up to the, the old homestead, the Bell Place. Today we're focusing in this video on the home that was built on that high knoll right there at the nearly at the beginning of the farm. It was uh, a high narrow hill that rose above the old uh, driveway that came up into the cove where the old house was. It was uh, high enough that there was a bank that we had to kind of scramble up if we wanted to get up there and stand on the peak. So, to build a house there, it was necessary to remove the top of that knoll by excavation, and that was what was done. Now, here's a map of showing the layout of the place that resulted that dark green area around the image of the house there is the approximate result of that excavation. That was the level area that was made through that uh, removing the top of that hill. As you can see there, there was not a lot of space. Most of the level space was in the yards, either on the south side of the house, where you entered, where you parked and came in, what we would call the front yard, and on the uh, north side of the house, which we considered to be the backyard. Most of our photos of this house are from years later, after the original cinder block structure was uh, stuccoed with white stucco and after a porch roof was added over that front porch. But thanks to Hoyt who found this photo from 1964, we have now a, a nice view of all of the front of the house showing the porch, our, our dog Fritz, the front door, the big window and the living room. As you can see from this, since it's a partial view, it was not easy to photograph the house. We have, even the later photos, we have side views uh, from the south or the north yard toward that porch. Here are two from the south yard. First, one of mother and daddy from about 1990, and then a slightly wider view of them with Ben uh, from that same time. We have another one from the north angle, uh, an unusual one of mother sitting down on the ground among her prized flowers. And uh, you can notice in the background there the a partial view of the old Willis station wagon, which proved important for all three of us at various times. And now for a little bit about the area around the house. From the early days there, there was a nice garden over here, just across the driveway. And then a bit further to the south up here, uh, note the toilet. Yes, we had an outdoor toilet at the beginning because we didn't hadn't completed the plumbing for the bathroom yet. So for about the first year, we used the outdoor toilet. Then, Further over to the right here, there was a garage built. Not immediately, but after a year or two, a garage was built here and a cow shed. And now back to the other side in that north yard, the, what we call the backyard, the clothesline. Well, of course, everybody in those days, most everybody in the country had a clothesline, and we did too. Mother had a new washing machine uh, with a nice spin dry cycle, but she still used the, the clothesline for drying. And uh, I remember assisting with that. I think we all did at some point, uh, putting the clothes out or taking them in. But that clothesline proved important for another reason as well. It was used for slaughtering the chicken. Uh, when we were going to have fried chicken, uh, Daddy would select one from the flock foraging in the yard and he would hang it up by its feet on the clothesline 
no laundry on the line, of course. He would use his pocket knife, which was always very sharp, to quickly slit the throat of the chicken, and then he would stand well back to avoid getting splattered with the blood. Then you take it down, take it inside, and we would douse it with boiling water, and uh, often one of us boys would be given the job of plucking the feathers out before mother took over and, and uh, butchered the chicken and prepared it for cooking. What I remember, I remember the, the knoll with the, there with the sage grass on top of it and a telephone pole before the, before the house was there. I remember going out there with you guys, I think, and standing on that, being on that knoll. So I, I have a, a recollection of that. There was a telephone pole in the middle of it, wasn't there? Yeah, I think so. So anyway, I remember that. And then I remember them coming with the bulldozer and, and scraping the top off, the, taking the top off the hill and digging the, uh, the basement, digging and the foundation. And I remember that um, daddy, because you said, well, he basically acted as general contractor on the house. And, mother yeah. and I remember mother and daddy had a plan. I remember seeing a plan. That, and I remember that um, daddy spe spe specified that he wanted, I think, 12 inch blocks for the lower part of the foundation. Yeah. Yes. And then they graduated down to maybe eight inch blocks. Yeah. Is that what you remember? That's right. Yes. I remember it was very carefully planned out and cause sort of over really over engineered. In terms of the woodwork and the, you know the rock, the blocks and everything to make it a really sturdy house. So, you know, I remember the uh, Woodson Emery laying the blocks, and I remember being in the house after it was the roof was on, it was dried in, and the walls were up. And I remember before there before the when the there were just two before partition. You know there were no before they put the sheetrock up or anything. I just remember being in the house with the with it framed in so you could just walk from room to room through the, you know, all you saw was the two by fours. And I remember that they especially wanted a full basement. I remember that was yeah. a big deal, having a yes. full basement. And that was being, a smart that was a smart decision. It was, yeah. And doing and being very careful to make sure that it was properly drained and would stay dry. I remember that. It's always warm down there in the wintertime and cool yeah. in the summer. Yeah. And I remember the big garage door. That was another requirement. Was originally a, a a double garage door there on the the driveway side of it. Oh, and one other thing. I remember at one before we had plumbing in the house. I maybe this is when the house was being built. There was an outhouse out back. Yeah. You all remember that? Oh yeah. I've got a, I've got a story to tell about that. Okay. Well, that may be the same story I'm thinking about because <laughs> we were down there, the three of us, and we were digging the the toilet pit. Is this the same story? Gerald? I'll go ahead. I'll... Yeah, okay. And the three of us were there and you were digging with a mattock. Had a had a like a hoe thing on one end and an axe head on the other end, and you hit a root and it bounced back and hit you right in the middle of the forehead. Yeah. I thought I was gonna ble I thought I was bleeding to death. And you were talking about the other time about, you know, if you get a cut on your head, you bleed really, really. so you did look like you were dying. I mean your face was covered in blood and well, I remember Dwight and I running out onto the top of the hill there, and the, some of the Evans people were down there, and the, I think Roy Evans was down there in his field. I remember Dwight and I yelling, Evans is, Evans is, help. <laughs> That's exactly right. I remember, remember that. that. Remember that? Yeah. It's not, it up. seems ridiculous. actually seemed ridiculous at the time, but I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> yeah. And they actually came up. Right. They came up, not, not rushing. They ambled up the hill, as I remember it. Maybe not. Maybe I'm being un, uh, unjust, but they did come up there and they looked at you. You remember this probably, Gerald. They looked at you, still face covered in blood, and said, I don't know which one, maybe it was Roy. One of them said, well, I think you ought to try to get him home. <laughs> and so we set off up the road. I don't yeah. even know. and. And I remember that I, I, I was, of course, really young, and I remember my first reaction was telling Gerald to run, run to the house. <laughs> and you, <laughs> and you were you saying, you say, no, right. no, that's not the right thing. He needs to sit down and, you know, be. be it was very scary, and yeah, I, don't, was, I don't remember yeah. if we had anything to mop the blood with or what. Yeah, a T-shirt or something. Yeah. Maybe a T-shirt. 
I remember the Evans family, them being very casual about it. I do remember that and not being particularly helpful. Yeah, not really especially helpful. Yeah. I mean, it, I was hoping they would at least give you know, take charge. And yeah. they just. I, I don't really remember them, but I remember one of the Jones, either Shelby or, uh, or Dorothy. It was Dorothy. To, took me to the doctor. Well, Daddy was probably at work until Mother probably had to call her. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just you. She took all of us, all of us, to the doctor in that jeep, okay. with no roof, no no cover on it. That's what I, I don't remember it. that. Uh, that was the only vehicle that was there. You remember it was it Dorothy or was it Shelby? It was Dorothy. Well, it was Dorothy. And uh, mother, I guess she was calling around, and she had the car but couldn't drive it. And I guess even though you could drive, you were in no condition to drive. And uh, and she found at called the Jones house and Dorothy was there, and Dorothy walked up there, ran up there, whatever, and and cranked up that jeep. I think it was a kind of a greenish, pale green one, and I remember it definitely had no no roof. It was all open, and we all piled in there, and uh, and went to Mars Hill, and they stitched, stitched you up. Okay, how long did we have the outhouse and not have plumbing in the house? Or was that just while the house was being built? No, I think we moved into the house uh, with no bathroom. Okay. Uh, just an empty room there. Yeah. And uh, with no central heating. Yeah. But how long it was, I don't know. Gerald, do you have any? any I, don't think, I don't think it was very long. Really. I don't maybe think one winter. Yeah, I think maybe. Maybe long. one winter. And then... Because I think it was that Daddy needed to accumulate some more money. You remember during the construction of the chimney, <clears throat> I can't remember what the deal was, but uh, Daddy came home from work. He was working days, man. Or I'm not sure what she had anyway. He came home and the fireplace wasn't being built to his specifications. And it seemed to me like he made an entire part of it out and start over. Do you I remember, remember that? that? Yeah. I remember this in a slightly different way. I remember that I, or, or possibly Hoyt and I, were we would go down there and watch watch what was going on, just watch the whatever it was, and and I knew that that was supposed to be that that chimney in that bedroom was supposed to be veneered with brick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it was not being when it came up through the floor. It was uh, cinder blocks. Yeah. And they were they were continuing to go. Uh, it wasn't Woods and Emery. It was somebody, I guess, right, subcontractors, right. and they were continuing to build in cinder blocks. Yeah. And I remember racing back up to the. I think I might even have spoken to them and asked, "Wasn't isn't it supposed to be brick?" I have some vague recollection of this. You remember that? You, that? Mentioned, you mentioned it. Yeah. And I think the way I'm remembering it is that we ran back up the road and got mother, told mother what was going on. And she came back down and clarified that indeed it was supposed to be brick. Yeah. Uh, you were, we were talking briefly about the design of the house. I remember that, I don't know who collaborated on the design, but it was, it was a homemade design. And I, I remember that originally, but the, ha the plan that they gave to Woods and Emery, the rooms were the same as they are now, or, or were when we lived there. Um, and there's that little central hallway, except that that front bedroom, you did not enter it from that hallway. There was a door, another, an extra door in the living room that was to the left of the fireplace. I mean, in the plan, the plan was. Yeah. And Woods and Emery, after looking it over, proposed not having a door there to the left yeah. of the fireplace and having another door in that little central hallway. And, uh, and, and everybody saw right away, oh, that's, that's a great improvement. So that was, that was how the, the plan came to be. Now let's go inside the house. The only pictures, actually, that we have inside are both of Hoyt and both 
apparently the same Christmas. And here they are. From the look of that dark window, uh, I would guess that we got it very early on that particular Christmas. That window uh, is the window overlooking the porch on the west side of the house. The interior colors were these, the original and for many years were these colors. This living room uh, was painted a sort of cool green-gray color called sage. The, uh, our parents' bedroom was a sort of lavender gray called mauve. The bathroom was pale pink. Walls, plastic wall tiles, pink fixtures, and I, I'm not sure, but I suspect that Mother insisted on pink for that bathroom, and she had been envisioning that for a long time, and, and nobody, none of her males had a voice in that choice. Gerald's room uh, and the small central hallway were a sort of sandy beige color. The front bedroom which Hoyt and I shared was a sort of aqua color. Notice the piano there on that wall, that inside wall. There's a story about that. When I was in uh, the later grades of elementary school at Flat Creek, the band leader from the Consolidated High School, North Buncombe, came by to recruit students to learn band instruments so that when they came to the high school, they'd already be able to join the band. Some of my classmates were very excited, and so I got very excited too. Went home, talked to my parents, and said, could I do that? Could I join the band? Well, they didn't say no, but mother said, well, what instrument would you play? Well, I hadn't thought about that very much. I didn't, as I remember, I didn't have a choice yet. So she said, why not the piano? Wouldn't that be more practical? Well. She won me over, and it didn't take much, actually. So the only problem was, where was the piano? I had a cow. Uh, I'd been given, as, as we all were, I think, a, a small calf uh, at some point when I was younger. In the meantime, that cow had grown up and produced a calf. So I had a cow and a calf. So I sold that cow and calf for $350 and bought a good old used upright piano, a big dark piano. I think it was a chicory, I'm not sure. After a few years of lessons, I was competent enough to take a turn as the volunteer pianist for church services in the old Piney Mountain Baptist Church building. No doubt, I enjoyed that small spotlight and continued through the remainder of high school and the four years of college. After I left home, I never again had a piano until after I retired when I bought another used upright piano and resumed practice. I'm still not very good, but I enjoy the mental workout and occasionally produce some musical sounds that I like. And now, on to the kitchen, which was a pale yellow color. And the kitchen, I think I can argue, was probably the most important room in the house to all of us, I think, as it's where we gathered to have our meals three times a day or twice a day during school, school time. The table where we sat is shown here in a diagram. This was the seating pattern through all the time that we were all still at home. Once Gerald was out on his own, I think it varied somewhat, and one of us might have moved around to take over his spot there and uh, give everybody a little bit more space. But through many, for many years, it was like this. The table itself was shaped like this picture, but the colors were different. The color, the formica on the table was a kind of a wood grain, kind of, I guess you could say, a walnut pattern, a dark brown. The chairs themselves were upholstered in a cream-colored leatherette. Otherwise, though, the shape was very similar to the, the one in this picture. Move up to the left upper corner, 
to the sink. Call attention, I have a little note there that there was a nice view. It really was a terrific view uh, out, and one great virtue of the house location was it had good things to see all around. But this was special because we could see the far distant mountains, which uh, we, th we assumed and I think were actually in Yancey County, because one among them was a famous bald mountain, and when it snowed in winter up there, there was a great white swath of that mountain that, that, it was, uh, that really gleamed in the distance. So I think whoever was washing the dishes, usually mother, uh, enjoyed that view uh, out to, to the north. There, there was not much storage in this kitchen, very similar arrangement to the others. That work table had a shelf underneath, the sink had some storage space under, underneath it. Mainly, as far as uh, cooking and food, the Hoosier cabinet there beside the work table was, was it. Uh, and it was sim very similar to this picture. That little uh, it was the door you see on the level of the counter part, that little door to the left was where Mother stored her bowl for mixing bread. And here's a picture of it. She used this almost every day, whenever she made biscuits in the morning or cornbread for supper. And it, was, it sat back behind the small door. And above that was a bin for storing grain, flour, or cornmeal. I will add one little personal note. This place, this kitchen, was actually where I first developed an interest in cooking which has uh, stood me in good stead the rest of my adult life thus far and continuing now. Mother encouraged me a little bit and I was happy to learn from her. She taught me many things and one time I remember I got very inspired and decided I was going to make a meal for the whole family. Uh, I don't remember much about what the side dishes were, probably mashed potatoes and green beans, something like that. But I do remember the main course. It was canned uh, Spam, a brand that we, we uh, obtained called Treat, but it was essentially Spam. I sliced it up and I made a very fancy sauce or glaze for it using probably apple jelly and kind of roasted it in the oven. Very grand treatment for humble Spam. But that was the main course and as I remember, there were no snide remarks about it. People ate it. There wasn't a shower of uh, compliments, but people ate, and I was very proud of the first meal that I prepared. And uh, now let's go downstairs. I must say we reveled in the wide open space down there. There really wasn't much there at the beginning. There was a new washing machine over here in the corner that had a, a handy spin-dry cycle that helped uh, would help Mother a lot. There was pretty soon a big chest freezer, which uh, made it much easier to preserve uh, garden vegetables or to shop for frozen foods. Daddy built a big workbench in the corner here, very sturdy, with a big, strong cast-iron vise and later he added a, a drill press. He was very generous, tolerant, I guess I should say. I don't think he was excited that we wanted to borrow his tools sometimes, but he was generous and he tolerated our uh, borrowing tools and probably making them dull and maybe not returning them to the right place. And he, but I must say he did expect us to be available to hand him tools when he was working on something serious. I'm surely the least handy of us three, but even I feel myself rev up a bit when there's something that needs to be done with a screwdriver or a saw or a wood clamp. And I owe that to daddy, no doubt. Gerald, at some point, did you, are you and Dale, are you and Dale, and did you have an, was there a T model Ford that you had in the basement of that house? Uh, a, it was an A model. A model, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, stripped down. Didn't have, a, I think he didn't have a body on it. I think he just had the motor and running gears and 
So was that like a Dale and Gerald project or where did you I get think that? It was. I yeah. think it was. Do you remember that, Dwight? I do remember it. Yeah. I had some impression that that somehow Dale got that from his grandfather. I'm not Jonah, sure. Jonah's that. rector. I think Jonah, Jonah Rector. Yeah. He always had a model. That was actually my favorite uh, period for the basement when it was all open, you know, when it still had the big doors there and it was all yeah. open downstairs. And with a dirt floor, I think, everywhere still. So was it a dirt floor down there? I thought I thought Init it initially it was a dirt floor. Was yeah. it okay? And then he had it poured. Okay. Huh. Uh, little by little, not all at once. I remember, um, and this I, I associate with the new house, that I remember a succession of Jeeps, but I remember one in particular that at the new house, and I remember Daddy saying it was a Ford Jeep. You know, back during the war, several different companies built yeah. the Jeep. Yeah. And but so if it was a Ford Jeep, that meant, had meant it had to have been a, a World War II Jeep. But I remember Daddy talk, talking about it. But I know uh, Willis didn't start making them until uh, either right. the latter part of the war or after it was over. So obviously, I mean, somewhere on it, it must have had Ford Motor Company because I remember Daddy <laughs> yeah. talking about that in, uh, in being a Ford Jeep. Probably about 1958, but certainly by 1959, we seemed to leap into the lap of luxury. After years of pickup trucks and Jeeps, Daddy purchased a used 55 Chevy Bel Air, which sported the popular two-tone colors of sky blue and pale cream. This four-door sedan was the first vehicle that could accommodate the whole family in comfort since before Hoyt was born, when Gerald and I were small enough to climb into the little rumble seat that Daddy carved out directly behind the bench seat in the 37 Chevy Coupe. However, by the time of this 55 Chevy, Gerald probably had his own wheels or found other more independent forms of transportation. Do you all remember, um, again, back to the basement at one point, do you remember we had an electric train, a Lionel electric train? Do you yeah. remember that? And do you yeah. remember that yes, we, had it set, we had it set up on a four by eight sheet of plywood on the uh, uh, the west end of that basement over there by the chimney? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. That same table, which was a thick four by eight plywood sheet mounted on a sturdy base of two by six and two by four boards, at another time served also for ping pong. Several years later, it was cut down to make a drop leaf desk painted bright red, and it served me well at several different homes in New York, Wisconsin, and Georgia, before finally being donated to Habitat for Humanity during a spell of downsizing in 2017. Another temporary basement project around 1959 or 1960 was a photo processing dark room contrived out of boards and tar paper in the southeast corner. This was to support my effort to learn photography with the assistance of our neighbor and good friend Lee Sluter. We had a plan that we would be partners in a portrait studio side business at his watch repair shop in Marshall during summers and weekends. The portrait business was a bust. I remember one customer who was far from thrilled when she picked up her rather dim finished portrait. But the net result of all that effort was not a total loss. I have copies of three portraits I took during that time. An experimental one of Lee Sluter himself another of mother, where it appears that I was again counseling toward a glamorous look-away pose, and the other one that I remain most proud about. The Shepherd family asked me to photograph grandmother Margaret Jane Shepherd, and of course I agreed. She sat in the dining room at the family home on Hobson Branch Road, and with the family hovering around, 
I anxiously set up my tripod in one of Lee's cameras. Grandma could not have been sweeter about my fumbling and muttering. Anyway, this was the result. It is the only studio-style picture of her from her late old age, and still, I think, not bad. Now, Gerald was talking about learning to drive at, uh, or in, in Beechery. I remember learning to drive on Daddy's old uh, 49 Willis station wagon. Or if you still had that. I know, I know. I, I kicked myself a million times for selling that. Yeah, I didn't know you had it. Yeah, Daddy gave it to me, and I was uh, at some. You know, point I drove. I, I drove that to commuted to Mars Hill College for four yeah, years. I that. remember that. Yeah, and I uh, at some point I was I had like three cars, and I need to raise some money. So I thought, well, I'm just going to sell everything except one yeah. one car, and I sold I sold it for something like six hundred dollars. You know, and, and I'd. Uh... I, when I was uh, going to AB Tech, I took the motor up there and we'd rebuild the motor mm -hmm. at AB Tech. Had a new motor in it. I remember that, yeah. And it had a, it was what, three speed three on speed the column and, and, and that overdrive, overdrive transmission. Yeah. And that I, thing's I, so weak, probably the only place you could, uh, didn't have enough power, the only place probably you could use the overdrive going downhill. <laughs> well, or yeah, level ground. But, um. But I, I remember I learned to drive basically driving it up and down the road there between the new house and the old house. Yeah. In 1962, I graduated from high school while in bed with a case of the mumps. And I heard secondhand that Principal Reeves had explained my absence in detail with a chuckle for all to hear. Later that year, I began commuting to Mars Hill College. While I had understood in theory that the workload for college would be much greater than high school, I was shocked to feel it for myself as the homework assignments began piling up. I quickly knew that I would need to work late at night in order to keep up. So I set up Grandfather Childers' old iron bed in the basement near the chimney base in the southwest corner, and Daddy provided a nice old roll-top desk that he had acquired, which went on the east side of that area, along with bookshelves and a typing desk built in against the east wall. I found a used noiseless typewriter so that I could keep typing if needed late at night without, I hoped, keeping the family awake. If I needed anything to keep me anchored during so much change, I still had to milk the cow every morning before I set off for Mars Hill in the old Willis station wagon. Well, one disadvantage of living out here in San Diego is that dinner time is arriving here soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So right, I don't want to be a school sport, but my stomach is beginning to growl. So it's six thirty there, and I can hear Ben's uh, from uh, growling all the way across the room. Okay, yeah, it's six thirty. <laughs> all right. Well, this was a great session. I think we, yeah. I think we've done the job now. Now yeah, we've got, we can, some, we've got some great material. Yeah, and it's been fun. Yeah. It's been, yeah. All right. Well, I thank you both. All right. Hey.